Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Cardiology Grand Rounds of October 30th, 2023. Um, I expect that we'll have uh, an excellent presentation today, as well as some, a lively discussion. Um, I want to start off with the uh, typical housekeeping issues that uh, we need to go over for MOC and CME. Let me just pull this up. Um, for today's gar cardiology grand rounds and for past cardiology grand rounds, we have a YouTube link. Um, if you just type in the Division of Cardiovascular Disease and Hypertension for RWJ MS, uh, we, you have the ability to go back into past grand rounds as well as to review today's grand rounds uh, um, after the event. Um, Secondly, for CME credit for this session, we ask you to text 20381 to the number there, 888-816-4893. Uh, to receive CME, the deadline is within 12 hours after the session is concluded. Um, and the text is an SMS message, uh, not an iMessage if using iOS. Again, 20381 to 888 8164893. We will put this in the chat box. And finally, to obtain maintenance of certification points for physicians only, uh, after you've completed step one and listened to today's grand rounds, uh, you can either scan the QR code that's on the screen, or you can answer a brief quiz at the Socrative.com web address that's on your screen, entering room code FUTURE55. Again, future 55, and uh, this will work if you've already entered your date of birth and your ABIM ID in your cloud CME profile. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, today's speaker, um, Dr. Masood Lassar. Uh, Dr. Uh, Lassar will be uh, speaking to us on the use of IVIS and coronary physiology to improve uh, outcomes in the cath lab. Dr. Uh, Lassar is the Baker Dean Endowed Professor in Interventional Cardiology at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Uh, he's been a professor for over 15 years and has been practicing for well over 20 years. He received his medical degree from Mashad University of the Medical Sciences in Iran and completed residency trainings at the University of Toronto and Yale School of Medicine in the Waterbury program. Later, he then completed fellowships in both critical care and interventional cardiology. He's the recipient of multiple awards, with his most recent being the University of Alabama's Medicines Award in 2018 and 2020. He's also the recipient of research, teaching, and best doctor awards. Uh, he has a vast research experience, which I'm sure he's going to touch on in today's presentation, and has led many research projects as both PI and co-PI. He's an outstanding writer and has published over 130 peer-reviewed publications and has written approximately 35 abstracts. He also serves as a reviewer for multiple well-renowned journals and has been an invited speaker at numerous scientific sessions. So Masood, uh, on behalf of myself and my colleagues, I'd like to welcome you today uh, for Grand Wounds, and we look forward to your presentation. Later, Dr. Tudor Vaganescu, our Director of our Interventional Cardiac Catheterization Lab here at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital will be joining us. And if anyone has any questions, they can also feel free to enter them into the chat so we can address them at the conclusion of your presentation. So we welcome you and the floor is yours. Thank you, Anthony, for quite the introduction. I really appreciate uh, uh, for uh, invitation to present uh, some of my work that I have done for last uh, 20 years. Um, share my screen. Oh, 
Okay, here we are. Okay, let me do this one. Okay, so uh, uh, Anthony mentioned my title. I appreciate that. It's my disclosure. So uh, something uh, I'm, going, I'm going to start out with the left main stenosis. You know, uh, uh, many of you know that left main, left main artery is the largest artery and most important artery in the body. And, uh, and supplies a significant amount of blood to the heart. And it, it, traditionally it's been called that left main stenosis is if you have stenosis in the left main, uh, it's more than 50%. Uh, but in geography, is only rough estimate. It's not accurate. And uh, uh, the thing is, uh, we struggle with the left main uh, stenosis and assessment is that many of us don't want to under-treat under the patient and risk the patient to uh, uh, under-treat the patient. And when we, we had doubt in our mind that left main stenosis may be significant, uh, we refer to patient surgery. I've done that many times. Uh, you know, when I was um, uh, started my uh, faculty appointment at University of Louisville uh, several years ago. And it's really mysterious for anybody in the past, but we did, we came through a long way. And I'm going to share some of my experiences with you. So uh, what that entails that uh, left main stenosis uh, in the past, it's been like that. When you put a guiding catheter in the heart artery in the left main, if that left main pressure uh, dampens, that meaning that you have reduced blood flow to your left main, that uh, indirectly indicates that your left main stenosis is significant. Or you do intravascular ultrasound and that your, your stent area, your lumen area is uh, less, is nine or less than that. That indicates that the lift is significant. And this was proposed by Dr. Neeson. He was one of the, you know, prominent intravascular ultrasound imager in the past. He's retired now. And then uh, some data came from Mayo Clinic and they uh, uh, proposed that 7.5 square millimeter is the size of lift main. Uh, it should not be smaller than that. But these are all uh, uh, were objectives, uh, were subjective at, and they uh, did not any real evidence for that. So this is one example of left main stenosis. This patient had underwent heart catheterization, and the cardiologist called that 50 to 70 percent stenosis at the osteum of left main. You see that left main osteum compared to body of the left main is tight, and send this patient bypass surgery. And in the background, you see on the spine that uh, there are clips, surgical clips, and these were, you know, surgically uh, the patient has surgery. But what happened after surgery, the patient came back uh, because uh, of chest pain, and then they did intravascular ultrasound. But intravascular ultrasound, this is intravascular ultrasound catheter, and left main is huge, it's big. It's not a sinus. But unfortunately, this uh, mishaps of uh, angiogram that uh, uh, overestimate or underestimate the significance of left main stenosis and makes such makes this terrible mistake to send the patient bypass surgery with no reason. And this was another uh, uh, scenario. This was one of my friend's patient, and he, he did the angiogram. And uh, as you see in the middle panel, uh, there is some stenosis, the guiding catheter, the catheter engaged, and you see a stenosis there. He mentioned to me when he, every time he engaged, left main dampened. And then in some of you, doesn't look bad. Some of you in this one, as you see some left main stenosis by naked eye. And uh, this could have been a spasm or something else. And he took more images and he was convinced that left main osteum is significant and sent the patient for bypass surgery. Uh, two, what happened to him two months later, he came back, patient came back and you see left main osteum looks pretty good by angiogram here, but the lima, you see retrograde flow to internal mammary arteries here that indicated of left main stenosis. 
and at the angiogram you see the injection of the uh, 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 limo uh, the left internal memory or you see that close suddenly uh, because compared to flow good flow in the native vessel that makes the, the internal memory already goes down so this patient went for surgery for nothing and uh, we uh, and he did uh, FFR at the end unfortunately was to end I wish I had done it before uh, but uh, that FFR came at uh, FFR 0.84 and pull, this is the pullback of FFR. This was one of our patients several years ago when I was at University of Louisville. This was a 67-year-old gentleman. He came in with motor vehicle accident and fractured hip and tibia. And uh, uh, the orthopedic surgery uh, wanted to do surgery, fix his hip and bones. And when he went to uh, uh, the uh, anesthesiologist wanted to uh, induce it uh, uh, during induction, he developed VT, v VF. They shocked him out of it and they canceled the procedure, extubated him and sent him to CCU. And then they sent it to us for heart catheterization. We did the heart catheterization by, uh, just by, uh, honestly, you see that this is the left brain and osteum, osteum, but all body, you say about 70, 80% stenosis. That was really the thing. There's nothing to hide about it, but all body, you say this is 80% stenosis. And so we, we referred this patient to bypass surgery. Surgeon looked at him and said, well, he's bedridden. Uh, even after bypass surgery, it's going to take uh, seven, eight days, 10 days to get him off the bed. And then uh, we cannot get him off the bed because of hip fracture. It's going to go die of uh, This is not patient candidate. So they sent him back to us to do PCI, a stenting. At that time, a stenting of left main really was a big deal. Now we have a lot of this trial with left main stenting. Uh, that showed the outcome of left main stenting with the Excel study is equivalent to bypass surgery. We have a lot of good data, outcome data. At that time, we did not have anything. We did not have Impera, we had Bloom Pop. So we had to just bite the bullet and do this. Um, but before we do, uh, we, we go ahead and extend it, uh, it came to my mind, let me let me do IVIS because I need to do IVIS to assess the lesion and then assess the results. So when I did IVIS, Incidentally, I found that uh, that lumen area is 12.5. It's bigger than nine. It was previously proposed and bigger than 7.5 previously proposed. And I saw uh, this is a wider area. The lumen area is huge, 22. Uh, given that this left main is big, even though you have some plaque in the edge of a stand, edge of left main, uh, but it's still lumen is not compromised. It's 12.5. And then uh, we did also fractional flow reserve. We put this pressure wire and measured the flow. Uh, did the FFR. FFR was 0.85. So this, by, by all means, giving two uh, uh, imaging study by FFR and IVUS, I was convinced this patient does not have left main stenosis. So why this patient had VTVF? I had no uh, uh, firm explanation, but uh, I postulated a constellation of increased adrenergic response and also hypertensive response during induction could have triggered VTVF. Uh, so I uh, stopped putting left main stenting because really I didn't feel the main this patient is ischemic and I spoke to anesthesiologists, I spoke to surgeons and uh, suggested to be a start the patient is more drip and uh, uh, induce one more time, try one more time. I stood by patient bedside and they did very safely. The patient had surgery and I followed this patient for years afterward with no, no problem. So these things really is eye opener that, you know, we should know how to deal with left main because it's important already. It's a small artery. It's, many of them you can treat it medically, but left main is no kidding and you have to uh, be appropriately treat that. And we also noted there's another patient that had a heart catheterization. As you see, this catheter didn't damp, and you see the flushing back. And surprisingly, you saw lumen area by intravascular ultrasound by 4.3, and then pressure wire uh, when we advanced that, but F4.63. This is clearly abnormal. So these two uh, cases uh, 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 provoked us to to investigate further 
to go to bottom line to see when we can say for sure this patient has significant left brain stenosis or doesn't. For that reason, we put together uh, a study. One a study was this. We published this in Circulation 2004 when I was in University of Louisville. We looked at for the first time correlation between fractional flow reserve and intravascular ultrasound for, we call that ambiguous left brain. It's really ambiguous. You don't know it's true or false to determine what's the significance of left brain stenosis is. So uh, we, uh, this is the correlation between FFR and IVIS for uh, lumen area. We found very robust correlation. And also we found the sweetest spot, cut point, where you can say the left main, you know, obviously the significant was 5.9 square millimeter uh, in the lumen area. Compared to, um, uh, uh, to uh, non left main coronary artery, the correlation in the lumen area is not that robust. Yeah, that, that, uh, this is another study. They looked at correlation between intravascular ultrasound and, intra and uh, fractional fluorescence in, in, really in left main, non left main stenosis. They found that really uh, correlation was moderate. Uh, sensitivity 69%, specifically 65%. It wasn't above 90% for left men. For left men is ubiquitous, are we? And, uh, and that's, that's a good thing that God gave us, and we can assess this better and treat the patient better. I was so excited about it. And we followed those patients that we did a study uh, for the uh, average of 36 months. And uh, we, the ones the patient uh, lumen area of uh, less, less than six, we extended it or sent by past surgery, majority of bypass surgery, whereas those more than six O had medical management. And th there was no difference in outcome. Couple of my curve showed really there, there's no difference in 36 months of 38 months of follow up. And then there is another group from Spain, Dr. Hernandez. They corroborated our findings in larger uh, study than ours. They had 354 patients. They followed those patients, the ones that had minimum lumen area of more than six versus less than six. And the ones that had a smaller lumen area, uh, less than six shown in red, uh, they went uh, stenting or bypass surgery. The ones that had bigger than lumen area went medical management. And they also corroborated our funding during the finding during two year follow up. They saw Kaplan Meyer really overlapped. There was no difference in outcome, meaning that you do intravascular ultrasound in these patients and uh, make a decision based on lumen area uh, of the six uh, cut point, uh, the, the, uh, these patients will do well uh, with the decision making, uh, meaning that if there is a smaller than six, you do surgery, uh, surgery or stenting, greater than six, don't touch him and send the medical management. Uh, this was, three, this, was uh, this graph indicated of series of patients, 16 patients, they had a lumen area of the six and they refused surgery, they want to do medical management and they did worse. You see the outcome is worse because uh, a small room and area of left main is not really a joke. And those patients do uh, do worse. Versus, you know, we have a lot of a study in ischemia trial, uh, non left main artery stenosis, even you do medical treatment, they do as well as uh, medical management, but left main really is not surprised. And you see anything like that, lumen area is smaller than six, they do worse, they don't do well. And we were so happy that finally this went to guideline and guideline uh, endorsed that, that patient uh, with left menstrual stenosis by IVS limb lumen area of six, uh, this patient should go uh, for intravascular ultrasound imaging and make decision about revascularization. And also, not only intravascular ultrasound help with the decision making uh, that to stenting or not to stenting. In this large study, over a thousand patients, uh, uh, they studied in Korea. Of the, all, all these patients underwent stenting compared with in geography. This was the patient left main stenosis, you see, as significant left main stenosis, and they have IVS versus in geography. That showed uh, decision making based in geography to stent the patient. They got worse outcome compared to IVIS. And IVIS is a good thing. You can see inside the vessel, but in geography, you don't see it. And you make estimate that you have good results, but based on IVIS, you get the excellent result and treat this patient appropriately. And those patients had better outcome.
And also caveat about left main, you know, this is for fellows, uh, they sometimes ask this question many times, why we couldn't do just FFR? Why we want to do IVES? The thing is, FFR is the flow uh, down the uh, uh, downstream, yeah, from left main to the LAD, to downstream to the distal vacuole circulation. So if you have any barrier, for example, you have here at the osteum left main, you have a lesion. If there's a barrier downstream in the LED, that barrier reduces the flow to the rest of the microcirculation. And that FFR does not reflect your true flow in the LED. So if you have uh, isolated left main, FFR is perfect. But many of these patients, they have LED lesion, circ lesion, as you see in the bottom screen, or LED lesion, significant LED lesion. And FFR is not going to be accurate. So those patients is required course that uh, to do intravascular ultrasound to define the significance of vision. And this particular patient had uh, unstable angina. As you see here, there's a uh, significant lesion in this star left main and austere LAD. So this uh, lesion could not be assessed by uh, FFR. Um, so we did IVES to de define whether this uh, LAD we knew probably is significant, but LAD looks Maybe 50%, excuse me, left main look probably 50% not bad. And this view looks maybe 50, 70%. But we want to make sure this left main is significant before we send this patient for bypass surgery. Because if left main is not significant, as you showed previous cases, the limo goes down and the patient gets worse outcome. So we did IVES. And IVES, you see, this is a left main uh, lumen area of six. We are, we are at the cut point, that's not significant. Anything less than six is significant. But that LED lumen area of 2.8 was sure was for sure was significant. So we're dealing with LED, not left main. We, we uh, uh, successfully went ahead and put extended LED, not the left main. And we had good results. So interestingly, you see by angiogram, uh, the LA, LED looks bigger than left main. Left main looks worse. But we didn't leave, left it alone like that. We repeated the IVES. And IVES did not change at all. That left main area 6, not significant physiologically. LED looks great. And I think we, we were convinced this is a very good result. This patient, two years later, I wanted to see him, make sure that left main is not progressing. Brought him the, 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 the angiogram. That LED looks good. This third left main is still looks like 50s per, per person stenosis. And this time we did FFR because uh, down the stream is not significant, LED looks good. FFR was still good, 8.84, not significant. Uh, we uh, uh, reassured the patient everything is good and continue medical management. So the, the decision making by imaging intravascular ultrasound, coronary physiology, they may made the significant change in our life in, in our decision making to make accurate decision for patients uh, uh, outcome. Without those, uh, really, we would have made bad decision and bad decision ended up ending up bad outcome. So another breakthrough that happened uh, in our lifetime, in my lifetime, that I saw that I was so glad to see that is the uh, using intravascular ultrasound to assess uh, outcome of stenting in non-left main artery. Uh, so uh, we used IVES for several years. There were a lot of data uh, in the bare metal stent, but in the era of drug routine stent, there are two studies, one of them IVES XPL study, and this is the ultimate study. This is really a landmark study. Yeah, it was done in China in over 1,400 patients. They randomized the patient to stenting of those artery like LED, CERC, or CA to IVES guidance versus angiography guidance and follow that patient in 36 hours to see IVES make difference in outcome of patients. And this is a brief overview of those results of those patients. I don't go over the procedure, all of that. So that three years, as you see here, it shows in uh, blue, uh, the patient had in, uh, outcome of those patients in three years. Those patients had a stenting based on angiography. The uh, major adverse cardiac event was about 11% at three years versus uh, about IVES was 6.6%, and this was highly significant. So that after three years, 
you extend the RV based on geography that many of our colleagues do it. They, they, they feel like they good good result by eyeballing, but, but I was, there are a lot of things that you don't see by geography that change the outcome. If my family member based on this data, I want I was done to take care of my family, not by geography, even expert ex interventional cardiologists cannot tell that the results is good by geography. And on the right panel, what you see is quite interesting. Uh, it's about fifty percent of those patients they had suboptimal result, PCI result based on IVS, and fifty. 50% they got optimal results. Op Suboptimal results meaning that stent area, minimum stent area was that less than five square millimeter or plaque burden was more, more than 50%. Whereas those patient minimum stent area now is uh, uh, standard. Anything more than five in native artery, uh, that artery is three or larger is, is, is uh, good results. And plaque burden is less than 50% is good results. And even among those IVS group, uh, the, the patients they had at three years, they had the excellent IVS result, the event rate was 4% versus 9% even with IVS group. So you IVS this patient, you, for sure you get better result than in geography. You IVS this result and do best, you get the best result, meaning that your MSA more than 5 and Blackbird in less than 5, you get the best result and nobody can match it. So based on this result, we uh, launch a new study, this study is in at the beginning, we haven't launched yet, we're waiting for approval of the grant. We used a new technique of IVS guided stenting. Based on this IVS guided stenting on previous ultimate study, the operator did post uh, stent optimization based, uh, based on their experience. Uh, it was not protocolized. And if, there is no standard protocol how to optimize a stent, how to get that magic number of five square millimeter. So in our proposal, what we su uh, suggested that this is the uh, distal reference artery, this is the artery, the intravascular ultrasound inside the artery, if uh, we extend the uh, state based on lumen area of five and, uh, uh, and also post dilation based on external elastic membrane diameter. So we deployed the stent, we measured the lesion lengths, and uh, a stent based on lumen area of three uh, diameter, and then post dilation based on 3.5. And then look at the final results. Uh, after you see this uh, plaque, this stent in the RE, if we are satisfied, meaning that minimum stent area more than five or 5.4 or plaque than less than 5%, we consider this as a good result. And, uh, and again, reiterate that we want to get minimum, minimum extent area of more than 5 or 5.5. And this is distal extent age. More uh, less than 50% uh, plaque burden, proximal more than 50%, less than 50% plaque burden. This is really should be a good result. So, this is our pilot study uh, in 30 patients. We wanted to see whether that works before we embark on a larger study. Actually, it did work, as you see the final result in blue, but in geography, but in red, by IVES. But in blue, only 35% of the patient, they got such a result. By uh, intravascular ultrasound, we got 87%. If you remember on ultimate study, the final result was 50%, the best outcome. Ours was 87%. But this is not comparing of uh, apple to oranges, but this is just uh, our pilot study. Uh, uh, because we use a special protocol uh, using that external elastic membrane diameter, and they did not use it. We believe this is true, that you can get best result, not in 50%, 87% of patients. So uh, this was one of our patients that he had the LED lesion, as you see here, and we burned it, and uh, then uh, we deployed a stent. After deploying a stent and post dilation with a balloon that we uh, to the reference lumen diameter, we have very good result, looks very good. And many of our colleagues, they will say this is an excellent result. They will quit, they don't do anything else. But well, when we did the uh, IVS after that, we saw that really noticeable is that lumen area uh, in that tightest part, uh, that stent part is 4.3. So this is less than five. So this is for sure is not a good result. 
but we'll also notice that this sort of reference that elastic uh, elastic external membrane diameter is uh, 3.4. So we under dilated the stent. So what we did simply, we went ahead put 3.25 uh, external balloon is smaller than 3.4. We didn't want to put 3.5. So this when we inflate to 15 goes to cross 3.4. And this is again, this is this is the result we got. And we did another IVS, but this time for sure, you see a stent area is bigger and a stent 5.64. We're convinced at this time we have very good results and this patient should do well with 87% outcome in one year, you can beat that results. And that's why the protocol should work. And based on this, uh, we uh, send a port, uh, uh, submit a protocol, 100 patient, 100 patient and uh, comparing this uh, based on IVS guidance, based on our protocol. Uh, I don't want to bore you with all of the protocol. Uh, we size the stent to distal external elastic membrane diameter versus control group. We did a stent based on conventional technique to see the final result, to see whether in randomized study we can reproduce that results. The protocol is going to uh, assist they make that high definition intravascular ultrasound. They're very interested in study. Hopefully we get this funded and get this started. Start, start so uh, 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 you're gonna switch the uh, gear a little bit and move to uh, fractional flow reserve. That, because that's something also we use our daily life in the cat lab and it's really changed the game significantly. So uh, uh, the, several years ago, when I was at the University of Louisville, uh, the, it, it was a big deal to do FFR uh, of multivessel disease. You know, many times to, I found out, you know, when you do FFR, when the patient has three vessel disease, they really, they don't have three vessel disease. They may have two vessel disease. They may have three vessel disease. You never know. Uh, but we, we measuring FFR, uh, but in geography, sometimes you say 70% lesion, but FFR by physiology is not significant. So based on this stat, we did a registry study. We didn't want to do offhand randomized study. Registry study, 140 patient, 60 patient, multivessel disease, they got FFR of PCI, uh, angioplasty based on FFR. 80 of this patient, this conventional operator thought any lesion more than 50, 70%, they did a stent. And uh, if the FFR was less than 0.75, we stented it versus the conventional or uh, anything more than 70%, they had a stent. So that was interesting. So you see in the diagram, uh, major, like 80% of this patient in the FFR arm, they had two vessel disease. Uh, only 20% uh, tw of those patients had three vessel disease uh, by FF by uh, angiography. But when we did FFR, uh, as you see, by FFR, those lesion we see seventy percent may not be significant. So it actually, this changed the game. That these patients, these folks, like seventy nine percent, they have two vessel disease. It turned out to be only one vessel disease. So we don't have to do majority of patients. Like seventy five percent of patients had only one vessel disease, not two vessel disease. In general, we fooled us. Only 9% of those patients had two vessel disease versus 79%. And 16% of those patients had no significant lesion. Three vessel disease, they walked out cat lab with no standing. And they were disappointed. We should say, oh, no standing after doing all of this? I said, well, you don't need to stand, you'll do well. Versus in the geography group, those folks had in geography group, 72% had two vessel disease. Uh, 20, 25 percent had three vessel disease. Even uh, a few of them had four vessel disease. Had to extend all of those vessels. But they turned out to be outcome. Uh, capital wire outcome. Thirty days, thirty months of follow up. We saw those patients had uh, FFR significantly better outcome compared to those patients had conventional. The, the reason is very clear. You know, some vessels that you, they're not significant. You put a stent, they get restenosis, they get MI, and they get poor outcome. But when you're vigilant, you do FFR, the patient do very well. 
And we also looked at the cost where you put less stent, the patient don't come for stenosis, as you see in this column. Uh, this, this column represents FFR versus red uh, by doing a geography. Uh, the cost was significantly lower. Although cost of FFR wire was higher than using regular wire, but that uh, translated in improved outcome, less stent, and still uh, cost was lower. And this was one of the cases, really interesting case. This patient had reversal disease, of course, and long LAD lesions. I would call it 70% by naked eye. This 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 is her lesion 80%. This LED, uh, our CA lesion 70-80%. We see this in our daily cat lab. Uh, uh, this patient need bypass surgery. Uh, this patient is not diabetic, but diabetic for you know no question. This patient need bypass surgery. Non-diabetic normal EF. Uh, but guidelines, you can put stent or three vessels, or you can do send them bypass surgery, but you still need to get uh, uh, surgeon's opinion. But uh, uh, because this patient enrolled in the study, uh, we did FFR of all three vessels. Guess what? FFR of that LED, 0.88, well, not significant. Really surprised me. Lesion long like that and just all diffuse lesion, but it didn't turn out to be significant. It was quite surprising. We knew that lesion in the circ is critical, no question about it. And we also still did FFR. You see 0.66 is significant, critical. After we extended it, improved 0.99, got normal, and that extent look good results. And our FFR of RCA, many FFR of RCA is not significant because F microvascular system in RCA is not significant, and FFR of was not significant, 0.92. So this patient uh, had only one simple stent, short stent in the stirk, and went home with no uh, additional stent of the LED, no additional stent of the RCA, no surgery. So really, it's a game changer. Based on this data, we launched this trial, famous study that all you know about, heard about it, that you know this is a really famous study, it's a fame. Uh, it's really fame. Uh, we gathered investigators in Europe and USA, and uh, we uh, designed this study, and this is basically design of a study uh, uh, over, uh, over 1,000 patients, the patient multiple cell disease, more, more than 50% stenosis. This time, they got randomized, 500 patients based on angiography, 500 patients with FFR, and we looked at one-year outcome. And one-year outcome significantly was better you, you see it here uh, by uh, uh, FFR versus angiography. But the thing is a uh, little bit eye-opener here that we looked at this data. Yeah, that's true. FFR was game-changer, improved outcome. Uh, about 40% of those patients did not have a stent, but outcome is better. But again, 13% uh, in one year adverse event rate, it, it seems too high. And... Uh, 30% reduction in event rate is, is really borderline. It's not really high. And also, turn out the famous study uh, at three years, it still uh, stood well, uh, less even in two years, but five years, no, there was no difference in outcome. And this kind of little bit uh, uh, disappointing. And that's why uh, this it is like that patient at the extending based on FFR with drug routine extent. We still have, you know, a, a kind of uh, uh, borderline results. This can be explained by some of the studies we've done. This is one of the studies we did at the University of Louisville with our colleagues. Uh, like this patient had RCA lesion, very critical lesion, and we did FFR was significant and put a stent, uh, very good result, FFR 0.97. Uh, so this patient based on FFR had excellent result. Whereas one patient had LED lesion, tight LED lesion, uh, we ballooned it, uh, and this lesion by FFR was highly significant, 0.71. We ballooned it and stented it by a stent. Uh, but if a four final if a four was 0.86, uh, it was not like 0.97, it was not robust. And so, why is that like that? Why we get uh, some patients very good results, some patients get borderline results? 
and it turned out to be difference in outcome. Uh, during two years outcome, those patients had perfect results. Outcome is great, but those patients have borderline results if a for the standpoint nine six. They had both that's uh, uh, not as good as outcome. Uh, so the, in order to tease this, in order to go into more detail, uh, to uh, identify what causing uh, that FFR be not good after putting a stent, FFR guided stenting, we gathered data. You see Dr. Hakim is there. He was one of the collaborator. And uh, we gathered data uh, from 16 country, 28 studies, huge study, 5,000 patients, to look into this more systematic approach, do meta-analysis, and see what makes a difference, why FFR uh, low, what does it mean after you extend it, FFR is low, and why, is, why FFR is still in a ischemic range, why FFR uh, drops. We found some good uh, answer about this. One of them is that this is distribution of the patients uh, that with bad FFR. It turned out about 12% of the patient after the stent is still FFR was less than 0.8 ischemic, meaning that they didn't get a stent. A stent didn't help. The reason is that a stent didn't expand well. Or maybe they had lesion distal to a stent, yeah, and uh, uh, but in geography was not really uh, good enough to, to do that. Or maybe, uh, and it is about 20% of the patient that mediocre FFR was less than 0 0.8, 0 0.85, not very good FFR. Uh, in about 25% uh, or 30% of patients, they had some uh, reason is about FFR, but it's still less than less than 0.9. Only uh, perfect results uh, was achieved only 25 to 30%. So the thing is, even we do FFR, even we put a stent, that's not the uh, final, final. Yeah, we get good results. Outcome is good for one year, but it's not really lot long standing outcome. So we need to do something else. And this is all 5,000 patients. We, we found inverse relationship between FFR outcome and uh, FFR result and outcome. Patients have uh, low FFR, poor outcome, high, uh, worse outcome, and, and increased rate of death. And this is also distribution of outcome, target vessel failure, and cardiac death, and MI. That also turned out to be, as we, uh, FFR is lower, uh, cumulative outcome is worse, and uh, when FFR is perfect, outcome is excellent. And uh, we, we also found the sweet spot, whereas FFR was 0.86 cut point. Uh, those patients had better outcome compared to those that FFR was less than 0.86 after stenting. Uh, and also those patients that FFR less than 0.80, they had increased it. So this is really alarming that uh, after doing all of those stenting and FFR, it, and uh, we don't me measure FFR, and FFR uh, is less than 0 0.80 after stenting, those patients have, will be exposed to patient increased rate of death. And uh, this is really amazing study uh, by Dr. Hakim, he, a large number of patients, 500 patients. So he, he did the same, uh, uh, strategy that we use in the past. He did FFR, he, uh, as you see here, FFR was low, and he did a stent. Uh, this is a stent average, a stent was 0.78, uh, the average of all of those 500, more than 700, 500 patients. Uh, this is average was 0.78. So he did something very intuitive. What he did, he uh, did uh, uh, post dilatation inside the stent, more dilatation. We did post dilatation, but he did further post dilatation. His result was good. He always that he did more stenting. Uh, the edge was not good. He did more stenting. He did also more stenting, more post dilatation, very vigorous approach. And he was able for first time to show that after doing all of that, you improved average FFR from 0.78 to 0.87. This was really remarkable. And he also was able to show for the first time that a uh, patient had FFR less than 0.86, had worse outcome compared to do more than 0.86. This is really is, uh, is uh, eye-opener 
that, uh, you know, this, these are things not easy. It requires a lot of skill, dedication, like Dr. Hakim did. Really applaud him what, applaud him what he, he's done, that he took his time. 500 patients is not easy. Uh, with all of the patients, he used systematic approach one after other to find out what the reason is. He could have done FFR, he could have stented it. If uh, eyeballing, good results, all done, uh, good result, a patient, uh, I followed the patient. But going, going through that famous study, we saw that famous study, a good result, but it wasn't really a robust study. He did something robust, he got excellent results. So in conclusion, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, 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 as you looked at it, angiographic assessment of left main stenosis inaccurate and sometimes is misleading. And I was needed to assess the revascularization or uh, continu continuation medical treatment, meaning that you have a left main area is less than six, those patients need bypass surgery or stenting. More than that, don't touch it. Don't assess by angiography, it's misleading as wrong. Uh, and unfortunately, most uh, physicians rely on their angiography. Many of them say, I'm doing this for 30 years. My eye doesn't go wrong, but they're wrong. Angiography is frequently misleading. In error of recording stent, optimization and stent. Well, IVS is important. As we saw uh, in ultimate study, uh, landmark study they did in China, and they showed that three years outcome is significantly better when you stent it based on IVS verbidal angiography. And, and also they showed uh, low post uh, PCI FFR. Uh, as we saw in the famous study and follow-up study, uh, independently associated with increased event rate. And finally, this is after Hakimi's study that he showed post-stent optimization by FFR IVS would significantly reduce the event rate and improve patient outcome. With this, I conclude that thank you so much for the invitation uh, and uh, appreciate for your uh, time. Uh, I'll be happy to answer your questions. Uh, thank you, Masood. At this point, I'd like to introduce Dr. Tudor Vaganescu, who is our director of our interventional uh, cardiology lab. I think I'll kick it off. I, I, I just want to change gears just a little bit um, and talk about intermediate coronary stenosis. You know, the flavor trial last year got a lot of play at ACC, and it showed us that FFR-guided PCI was non-inferior to IBIS-guided PCI. And with FFR, there was fewer stents and no difference really in the primary clinical outcome. So I think what we learned is you need to go beyond the angiogram for intermediate coronary stenosis, very much the same way with the left main literature that you presented. What guidance do you give the interventional cardiologists when they're pressed for time in the lab and they need to make a decision to intervene or not. Some have said FFR is the arbiter to treat or not to treat, but imaging is the mechanism to optimize the treatment. You have any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. That's the thing we always deal with it. You know, we have 10 cases. Um, we want to do those things that Dr. Hakim did. It's really meticulous, time-consuming, but you get best results. Uh, so my take on that, uh, somebody is stable coronary artery disease, uh, but if somebody has non STEMI, those are different ball games. Uh, so stable coronary artery disease that we see those patients, we try, uh, we should do uh, um, um, a stress test in, in those patients, not to take him to cat lab. I have angina, uh, the patients say, oh, I have angina. That and we'll go ahead and move the patient to cat lab. We do we do all our best to do uh, maybe uh, CT scan, whatever it takes to define the coronary anatomy or physiological assessment lesion stenosis. 
is being shown nationally, only 40% of the patients they go to cat lab, they have a stress test. Majority don't have it. That's so that changed significantly. Well, 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 some of those patients, they come into cat lab, uh, some of those stress tests are, uh, uh, are, are not really informative and doesn't correlate with the lesion. And, and I think, you know, either you can do FFR of the lesion uh, and they find that lesion is significant and move on to a stenting. And then after stenting, the one Dr. Hakim did it to uh, um, put the wire back in the, uh, in the uh, uh, artery and do remeasure the FFR. You have FFR more than 0.86, you have good results, you're done. But on the other hand, if result is not good, FFR is 0.80, you know, that, although what look point is good, I think, I think that requires stenting, uh, iversing. You iverse it and then uh, they, they decide what you have to do. You do further postponement deletation, you iverse it and send it. This is the thing pretty much we use every day in our cat lab. Or some uh, operators, they decide to do IVS, uh, IVS it. But if you IVS it non lift main, uh, IVS doesn't correlate well with physiology. You may get luminary of 2.8, but you don't know what to do with that. And based on that, you have to do FFR anyway. Why not to begin to do FFR? Uh, FFR is significant. You know that you have to put a stent. And you put the stent, you can do optimization based on FFR or a stent. Uh, yeah, what's your opinion, Tudor? I, 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 I want to congratulate you for this fantastic lecture in which you summarize uh, more than 30 years of knowledge uh, in a very elegant manner. Uh, what we see now, and is going to be more data coming out, is this push from hyperemic uh, determination of the flow reserve to the non hyperemic one. So I'm talking about the instant uh, uh, flow reserve. There are di 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 three different vendors with three different technologies on the market. Uh, and then you move to what I will call it the semi invasive one, which is going to be the cast works. So you have the angiogram, and the angiogram is going to show you exactly the, the uh, flow reserve per vessel through um, artificial intelligence. And I, I, I think that patients who are stable should not come to the lab if they don't have a CT guided FFR. So, so this is something that's emerging, it's out there. And I, I think once you determine that there is a lesion that you need to treat, uh, intravascular imaging is a must. And it won't matter if it's IVAS or OCT, uh, they, they both are proven again and again and again that they improve outcomes. There is a small glitch now with the Lumium 4, perhaps you want to, to uh, comment on that. But, but I, I don't think in a bigger picture that anybody will abandon doing intravascular imaging in terms of optimizing the stress, the, the stand results. And I, I think in our lab uh, combined, so all together, we do more than 30% of intravascular imaging, which is pretty high comparative with the national average in the United States. That's uh, close to 10%, to I think it's 8 or 9%. Uh, but I, I, I think without doing these things, uh, you are uh, always in, a, in an ocean of error and guessing. So, so, and geography is always uh, considered an imperfect tool, an imperfect method, and doing additional things to decide if you have to intervene, and this is the, the flow reserve, regardless how it's done, and then followed by the intravascular imaging uh, creates the contemporary uh, intervention area. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. In terms of uh, non hyperemic uh, um, flow measurements like IFR, uh, that you mentioned, yeah, now we don't give adenosine, now it's contemporary era is IFR, but IFR correlates of FFR. And also the largest study, I didn't get to that with, uh, because of our time constraint, uh, the, uh, they define IFR, 3,000 patients, they're going to be, uh, it's a study of ongoing, the randomizing the patient uh, with IFR guided stenting uh, and optimization versus in geography. In 3,000 patients, we will get further insight in terms of outcome of those patients. And also after that ischemia trial, our threshold to be somebody in ischemic heart disease, stable ischemic heart disease, if you know this patient does not have left main or significant vessel disease, if the patient is stable, we based on guideline, medical management is still the best. But the once the patient is getting angina, uh, it is uh, a positive stress test, 
uh, those patients when they come to cath lab, uh, we, we know like somebody has large anterior ischemia and we see LAD lesion, that you don't need to do physiological studies. You can extend this based on uh, IVS and they get the best results. But sometimes patients have multivessel disease, uh, it's very hard to pinpoint where is the uh, ischemia is because they have inferior lateral, uh, inferior lateral posterior ischemia. Uh, and then I, uh, doing FFR or IFR will determine that uh, artery that looks significant is uh, that it need, requires to uh, P P PCI. And even you do PCI, putting a stent, uh, is, all of this data shows uh, it's not the final game. And you do PCI, you put a stent based on uh, without IVS, without further uh, confirmation of the results, you, your outcome could be not good. Even some, some patients at FFR of less than 0.80, they will die. And that's why we don't want to do that. The best thing would be at that time to either do IVS or uh, by, by FFR to reassess the results and to get best outcome. Yeah, this is time consuming, but you think all of interventional, they get the culture of doing this in their life would be easier. The cat lab, uh, they get accustomed to this and when you do this they get the set up very really in our cat lab it takes three minutes to get everything set up i'm sure in your cat lab also lives like that in some areas some countries there is uh, the resistance and penetration of ffr and ivs is low I heard some of them as 5% because the uh, operators are not comfortable. The cat lab people are not comfortable. It takes some time to, to get the hurdles of the learning curve, and that's why they don't use it. But if you do it, you use it in our everyday or practice, really easy and simple to do. Peter, anything else to add that you'd like? No, I, as we, we touched everything, uh, it's, it's this kind of um, I said it's, it's, it's right because it's a culture change when you do these things. It's extremely difficult to get everybody on the same page, on the same common denominator that you should do these things. And uh, I remember uh, when when we first started here um, and we started doing these these things, people looked at oh, it's very time consuming, and it is because it takes lots of um, you know dedication. We usually measure ourselves uh, the the um, um, images that we have, and we decide what to do. And we do multiple runs per case. That's why we do uh, most of the time uh, IVAS instead of CT because we want to save the dye. But I, I think the reward is that the patients uh, in the end don't come back with, uh, with uh, stent thrombosis, which is catastrophic. Uh, patients stay very long out of instant restenosis. Uh, you have a very good result. Um, and I think from the logistical point of view, the only understanding on the, on the administrative side is that these cases last a little bit longer. So you cannot expect that they move past the moment when you start uh, doing intravascular ultrasound or, or OCT. So that's going to add a little bit of the case. But the moment when the, the, the staff is comfortable and the operators um, agree, it's a, it's a you know, um, kind of general agreement that certain lesions are going to be, to be uh, instrumented in this way. For instance, all the mains um, or chronic total occlusions, most of the MIs, the acute coronary syndromes, then, then it becomes a culture of the lab. And I was surprised when uh, when the companies told me that our lab is uh, it's in the first eight hospitals in the United States in use of intravascular ultrasound. It's one of the, the highest levels. I mean, it's it's a par level that the first eight hospitals have in terms of uh, of intravascular ultrasound use. Yeah, I agree with you. To the application of this uh, requires uh, uh, learning curve. And here's the fact: uh, there was a survey from Dr. Gary Means. He published this in editorial. Dr. Gary Means is one of the biggest in the country. He's famous Ivis guy. I'm just telling for you know non-interventionist from audience. He's one of the most famous uh, uh, intravascular imaging guy. Uh, there was a survey from him in, in his editorial. He says about. Uh, Fifty percent of interventional uh, fellows, they graduate, they're not familiar with IVIS. They don't know how to interpret the IVIS and apply that IVIS in practice. So I think this is incumbent on us as a teaching institution to teach our fellows. 
not 50%, at least 80% of them get 90% get them trained uh, in intravascular imaging physiology. And when they go uh, outside, they, they uh, embrace this practice. But if you don't learn, they don't do that. And then vicious cycle continues. Like many cardiologists, I, I agree with you, they don't do routine FFR, they don't do routine IVS because they think it's time consuming, they think it doesn't change your practice, but now with more data uh, that is there long-term events of uh, outcome of FAME2 study, ischemia study, all of them they see they they see the role for uh, physiology and intravascular imaging and they're getting gradually used to it and they're doing more as compared in the past. Now FFR is class one indication uh, by ACHA guidelines. So if you stented the lesion without doing FFR, uh, that's really against guideline. And especially get stent thrombosis, you know, they, they, that cardiologist will be in trouble. They know about this. So that's really incumbent on them to do that. For our teaching institution, uh, it's incumbent on us to teach fellows uh, not to be in 50% range, be 80, 90% range, to learn fully and apply this and improve patient outcome. And that's also important to do that. You know, the patients are family member to get the best results for first outcome. Yeah, it may take 30 minutes longer, but so what? That's a good thing to do to get better results, better outcome, as Dr. Hakim did. Well said, Masood. Uh, this is putting evidence-based medica- medicine into practice and, and teaching the next generation of interventional cardiologists the need to learn this skill set uh, to ensure those outcomes. So I'd like to thank you, Masood, for uh, an invigorating conversation. We, we appreciate you coming uh, and uh, enlightening us today um, on IVIS and FFR, uh, particularly in left main disease. And uh, at this point in time, I'll close today's grand rounds. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And please uh, make sure you text the number for your CME and answer the question for your MOC points. Good night, and thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank, thank you. you very much.